forward. Please spare a mockingbird an introduction. As a reader, I loathe introductions. To novels, I associate introductions with long-gone authors and works that are being brought back into print after decades of interment. Although Mockingbird will be 33 this year, it has never been out of print and I am still alive, although very quiet. Introductions inhibit pleasure. They kill the joy of anticipation. They frustrate curiosity. The only good thing about introductions is that in some cases they delay the dose to come. Mockingbird still says what it has to say. It has managed to survive the years without preamble. Harper Lee, 12 February in 1993. Chapter 1 When he was nearly 13, my brother Jim got his arm badly broken at the elbow. When it healed and Jim's fears of never being able to play football were assuaged, he was seldom self-conscious about his injury. His left arm was somewhat shorter than his right. When he stood or walked, the back of his hand was at right angles to his body, his thumb parallel to his thigh. He couldn't have cared less, so long as he could pass and punt. When enough years had gone by to enable us to look back on them, we sometimes discussed the events leading to his accident. I maintain that the Yule started it all, but Jim who was four years my senior, said it started long before that. He said it began that summer Dill came to us, when Dill first gave us the idea of making Boo Radley come out. I said if he wanted to take a broad view of the thing, it really began with Andrew Jackson. If General Jackson hadn't run the creeks up the creek, Simon Finch would never have paddled up the Alabama, and where would we be if he hadn't? We were far too old to settle an argument with a fist fight, so we consulted Atticus. Our father said we were both right. Being Southerners, it was a source of shame to some members of the family that we had no recorded ancestors on either side of the Battle of Hastings. All we had was Simon Finch, a fur trapping apothecary from Cornwall whose piety was exceeded only by his stinginess. In England, Simon was irritated by the persecution of those who called themselves Methodists at the hands of their more liberal brethren. And as Simon called himself a Methodist, he worked his way across the Atlantic to Philadelphia, thence to Jamaica, thence to Mobile, and up to St. Stephen's. Mindful of John Wesley's strictures on the use of many words in buying and selling, Simon made a pile practicing medicine. But in this pursuit, he was unhappy lest he be tempted into doing what he knew was not for the glory of God, as the putting on of gold and costly apparel. So Simon, having forgotten his teacher's dictum on the possession of human chattels, bought three slaves and with their aid established a homestead on the banks of the Alabama River, some 40 miles above St. Stephen's. He returned to St. Stephen's only once to find a wife and with her established a line that ran high to daughters. Simon lived to an impressive age and died rich. It was customary for the men in the family to remain on Simon's homestead, Finch's Landing, and make their living from cotton. The place was self-sufficient, modest in comparison with the empires around it. The landing nevertheless produced everything required to sustain life except ice, wheat flour, and articles of clothing supplied by riverboats from Mobile. Simon would have regarded with impotent fury the disturbance between the North and South as it left his descendants stripped of everything but their land. Yet the tradition of living on the land remained unbroken until well into the 20th century when my father, Atticus Finch, went to Montgomery to read law and his younger brother went to Boston to study medicine. Their sister Alexandria was the fence who remained at the landing. She married a taciturn man who spent most of his time lying in a hammock by the river, wondering if his trot lines were full. When my father was admitted to the bar, he returned to Maycomb and began his practice. Maycomb, some 20 miles east of Finch's Landing, was the county seat of Macon County. Atticus's office in the courthouse contained little more than a hat rack, a spittoon, a checkerboard, and an unsullied code of Alabama. His first two clients were the last two persons hanged in the Macomb County Jail. 
Atticus had urged them to accept the state's generosity in allowing them to plead guilty to a second-degree murder and escape with their lives. But they were Haverfords and Macomb County a name synonymous with jackass. The Haverfords had dispatched Macomb's leading blacksmith in a misunderstanding arising from the alleged wrongful detention of a mayor. were imprudent enough to do it in the presence of three witnesses and insisted that the son of a bitch had it come into him was a good enough defense for anybody. They persisted in pleading not guilty to first degree murder. So there was nothing much Atticus could do for his clients except be present at their departure, an occasion that was probably the beginning of my father's profound distaste for the practice of criminal law. During his first five years in Macon, Atticus practiced economy more than anything. For several years thereafter, he invested his earnings in his brother's education. John Hale Finch was ten years younger than my father and chose to study medicine at a time when cotton was not worth growing. But after getting Uncle Jack started, Atticus derived a reasonable income from the law. He liked Macon. He was Macon County, born and bred. He knew his people. They knew him, and because of Simon Fitch's industry, Atticus was related by blood or marriage to nearly every family in the town. All right.